following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We study the Kabbalah in order for us to go deeper into our understanding of the scriptures so that those scriptures can aid us in our own psychological revolution so we can come out of the painful circumstances within which this humanity has become enmeshed. The sad truth is that as much of an optimist as we may be, death is inevitable and suffering is a fact of our daily existence. We live in times of incredible uncertainty with an ever-growing number of terrifying threats surrounding us. And from day to day and year to year, our circumstances appear to grow more desperate. All of us would love to find some solace, some respite from the terrors that hunt us during the long days and long nights. In spirituality, we pray and hope is that solace, that's that place of safety. But unfortunately, in these times when we seek out spiritual guidance and aid, oftentimes our suffering becomes more intense. Because many of those who proclaim themselves as spiritual guides, prophets, or otherwise spiritually inspired are in fact fooled, deluded, confused. The Kabbalah is an ancient science that reveals the underlying structures and mysteries in every great religion throughout time and space. The Kabbalah is not the providence of a particular group, although in this time it is claimed as such. But in fact, the Kabbalah is the divine birthright, the divine heritage for all humanity, and thus it must be known by everyone. If we seek to escape suffering and return back to Eden, Eden is a Hebrew word that means bliss or pleasure. And as you've learned, if you've listened to or studied the lectures that have been coming for the last few months, this word Eden has many levels of application. 
But in its synthesis, we know that Eden refers to a state of consciousness that is beyond our current state. And it is a state of consciousness within which mankind can communicate with God. This is symbolized in the first book of Kabbalah, which we call Genesis, or Bereshit. When humanity lived, existed in a state of bliss called Eden, symbolized as a beautiful garden within which there was no death, no suffering, but only happiness. We long to return to that, to have once again that blissfulness in our existence. And so we study this myth because really the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent is a form of myth. It is not a literal story. Unfortunately, many in these times read these biblical and scriptural events and stories and take them literally and they miss the point. These stories are Kabbalistic, meaning that they hide a greater truth. They hide a mystery that one enters into by degrees, by stages, little by little, in accordance with what one earns. You see, the myths and stories of the Bible and all the great religions are in levels. And we penetrate into those levels according to our own state of consciousness. In other words, to understand the myth of Eden, we must enter Eden. And to enter into and understand the deeper meanings of Eden, we have to enter those deeper levels consciously, as a mind, as a heart, as a person. This is something that we have to experience. It has nothing to do with belief. Neither does it have anything to do with patrimony. Our inheritance. You cannot inherit the Kabbalah. You cannot inherit Eden. Eden arrives as a state of consciousness that's produced by cause and effect within oneself. It does not arrive outside. It arrives inside. And the same is true of all the great mysteries that are hidden in the Bible and other scriptures. This myth or story of Adam and Eve in the garden is symbolic of the causes that produced our current situation. Humanity is kicked out of Eden. We do not live in Eden. In fact, most people don't even really know what it is, while the rest don't believe in it. This is how far we've gone. We don't even believe that there is a state of consciousness better than the one we have now. This is a sad truth. Fortunately, the science exists for us to return to that state and experience it. So when we study this myth, we see the primary elements are a man and a woman, two trees, and a serpent. These elements are like divine archetypes, very deep and rich symbols that represent many aspects, not only of nature outside of us, but nature inside of us. Throughout the many books and, and lectures in the Gnostic tradition, these levels are explored so that we can start to understand them in ourselves. This kind of investigation is not given for entertainment. This kind of wisdom is not given just to be interesting or to be clever. We study this material because we want to return to Eden. And in order to do that, we need to recognize Adam, Eve, the trees, and the serpent in ourselves. 
And we have to change the situation that's happening in us day to day. You see, when Eve is tempted by the serpent, this relates to an event in our long past history. A long time ago. But it also relates to our behavior today. And this is what we've discussed in many of the recent lectures about the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge. The linchpin, or the, the key axis around which this entire myth rotates, is the serpent. Any of us who have a background in any kind of religion, particularly Judeo-Christian, we know that there's always a bad guy. And we like to blame the bad guy. We like to avoid our own responsibility and point the blame at someone else. So most of the time when we study a religion, if, particularly if we grow up in a Judeo-Christian tradition, we like to blame Satan or the devil, and we call him Lucifer. And all of this, this, this figure, this bad guy, is always something outside of us. We always blame this outside force. But the fact is, the devil is within We suffer because of our own actions. We suffer because of our mistakes. We receive what we are due. And this is stated very clearly in every religion, that every man will receive according to his works. We reap what we sow. There's no avoiding this, even though we do our best to avoid it. This serpent, depicted in the Bible, is blamed for the suffering of humankind, but wrongly. This is one of the many misinterpretations propagated by uh, many groups that has given rise to a tremendous misunderstanding of these great religions. In reality, Christianity and Judaism are beautiful religions that contain tremendous beauty and many truths. But unfortunately, they have also been perverted, twisted for the convenience of our own mind. You see, when we don't like something in a religion, we tend to change it or avoid it. And we see this is very common now and how people like to invent their own religions. Or they say, well, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in this part and that part. Or I'm a Jew, but I don't do this part and that part of the tradition. This kind of pride that gives us, that we take upon ourselves the right to edit our own religion, illustrates a tendency in the mind of humankind that's been present for centuries and that we've been doing to our religions for centuries, and is a great contributor to why we're in the mess that we're in now. The mysteries need to be clarified and restored. The mysteries are great cosmic truths that descend from God, and that cannot be edited. If we want to return back to Eden, and to enter a superior level of being, we need to know in detail how to do it. We cannot avoid steps. <clears throat> Thus, we need to investigate our own religions with objectivity, without attachment, but to investigate them deeply, impersonally, in order to discover the truth. And so it is with this serpent. The serpent in the story of Garden Eden, serpent appears in the garden to tempt the woman. The serpent does not tell the woman to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He merely asks her about it. 
and tries to clarify the law regarding that tree. The woman is tempted by her own desire to eat the fruit, not by the serpent. Yet, religions blame the serpent and put all of the fault on him. And this begins in the very heart and core and beginning of the entire religion. It unravels and degenerates the entire thing. Because the, the very beginning of Christianity and Judaism is that temptation. And if that understanding is incorrect, you cannot understand the religion at all. You can't understand the whole tradition because its very seed, its very essence is corrupt. This is why we refer to Kabbalah. Because the Christian scriptures are only a fraction of the entire teaching. In fact, the Christian scriptures are also heavily edited <clears throat> and corrupt. This is partly why in the Gnostic tradition we study all scriptures and all religions. Because we know that they all emerge from the light. And the light teaches in different ways at different times, but always the same message. And so by comparing all of these traditions, we can arrive at an understanding of that light. In the Kabbalah, this serpent is explained more clearly. In fact, it is stated that it wasn't the serpent at all who tempted Eve. It was an angel who was riding on the serpent. You see, in the Kabbalah we read that <clears throat> Samael, the angel, descended from heaven riding on the serpent. And all the creatures saw his image and fled from him. Then Samael and the serpent approached the woman with words and brought death upon the world. So you see, this is profoundly different from what's taught in Sunday school. Samael is the name of an angel. A very important angel. Who unfortunately has been removed from the Christian tradition and has been trampled in the mud in the Judaic tradition. But in the very scriptures, it is stated that Samael is a great angel. The title of today's lecture is The Son of Samael. But for us to understand who the son of Samael is, we need to first know who Samael is. This name, of course, is Hebrew. And every Hebrew letter has meanings and numbers related to them. When we look at the components of this word, Samael, we see that it ends with El. And this word when it's on its own, means God. So in the Bible, there are places where the most holy God is called El. He's also called Elohim, which is plural for gods, or gods and goddesses. And Elohim comes from El. In Hebrew, this name Samael is spelled Samek, Mem, Aleph, Lamed. Four letters. This is a four-lettered name of God, a tetragrammaton. This is important. The first portion of this name is Samek Mem. When written alone, Samek Mem means poison. This is how it's usually explained. But really, this word has many more meanings attached to it. It can mean drug. It can mean medicine. It can mean simply a bitter beverage. 
It can also mean perfume or potion. So the name Samael means the medicine of God, the perfume of God, the poison of God, the drug, the bitter beverage. All of these are accurate translations. In the Kabbalah, we learn that Samael rode a serpent into the Garden of Eden in order to talk to the woman. The serpent is the Divine Mother Kundalini. She is symbolized in the first letter of the name of Samael, the letter Samek, which looks like a circle, but it represents that serpent who eats its tail. that cosmic womb, the Ouroboros, the great serpent of the universe, which is the ancient symbol deep in the heart of every religion, the dragon of nature, the great dragon, the great serpent. And this Samek, the letter Samek, is a circle that's constantly in motion, rotating, represents the cosmic womb of the Divine Mother, the fire at the base of all existence, the eternal cycle of life, night and day, dark and light. Two sides of the same thing, but which is always positive. This is the great mystery of the Divine Mother, the very first letter of the name Samael. But in addition, the letter Samek is the 15th letter of the alphabet. The 15th letter is related to the 15th arcanum, which is passion, the devil. So we see here some very interesting contradictions, so we would say, so we would think. But this is part and parcel. This is integral to the nature of this great angel. Duality. The positive and the negative. Light and dark. Black and white. The second letter in his name is Mem. Mem is the 13th letter. and relates to water. The Mem represents the great waters of life, which are within the womb. So you see the Samek and the Mem are very deeply connected. In fact, their shapes are very similar. Mem represents the Mayim, the waters. And it's from the waters that all life emerges the waters of creation. And these waters are the waters that are in the womb of the Divine Mother. Furthermore, Mem is the number 13, which is the arcanum of death. Immortality. Change. So with these two letters, we can start to understand something somewhat disturbing about the nature of this angel. That his name carries death and the devil. That his name is related with passion, but also with the power of creation, the water and the womb. This is a very potent name very powerful name. But do not forget that it ends with El, meaning of God. In other words, we're talking about death as a power of God. This is very 
very important. This angel, Samael, is said to be related with the planet Mars. And he states that explicitly in the Zohar. Samael says, I rule the planet Mars, whose domain is killing and war. And we know this is true. Mars is related with the Sephira Gebera, which is the fifth sphere from the top down on the Tree of Life. Gebera is related with Mars and with the sun, and it is the domain of justice, severity, punishment, but from God. In other words, when God needs to send his force to render judgment or punishment, it is the force of Samael, that angel who does it. This is why even Moses said, God, let me not fall into the hands of this angel. Out of respect, because Samael is an angel. So when we look into the Garden of Eden, we see that Samael rides on the serpent. And of course, that serpent is the first letter of his name, Samech. And that serpent is the Divine Mother Kundalini, the very energy of creation. But in the Bible, the serpent comes to tempt the woman in relation with the tree of knowledge. This indicates a very deep relationship between divine knowledge, the knowledge of God, and the Divine Mother, and death and water, and the serpent. All of these things are deeply, deeply profound. And the meaning is not easy to grasp. But what we can see is, when we investigate the many traditions throughout the world, we find this tree, and we always find it's related with a goddess. Nut, in the Egyptian tradition, is the goddess of the tree. And we see pictures of her. She's always pouring out a liquid to sustain the life of her believers, of her followers. And that liquid is the beverage of God, the medicine of Samael. It is the ambrosia or the soma in Sanskrit terms. Soma is that ambrosic or amritic liquid that gives the power of creation, the power of immortality. Immortality is this 13th arcana, arcanum. And it emerges from the waters of the Divine Mother, which are the 13th arcanum. But we know that when we arrive at real knowledge, for example, just hearing about this teaching physically, it can taste bitter. It can taste intense. It can shock us. That knowledge is Samael. It is the essence of this angel, Samael. It is a bitter beverage to the ego. It is poison to the ego. But it is the potion or the perfume of God. And thus we enter into a great conflict psychologically when we encounter gnosis or da'at, knowledge. I'm talking about real knowledge, the esoteric knowledge. We feel a great shock to the depth of our soul. And most people run away because it's so intense. And it's a poison that directly affects the ego, the personality, and terrifies the ego. Because that angel, Samael, is the angel of death to the ego. The angel, Samael, is Mars, Ares, the god of war against the ego. You see, Ares, Mars, Samael is the same force. 
He wages his war on behalf of God. Not for selfish purposes and not to punish indiscriminately, but to punish on behalf of God, with the permission of God. Samael does the will of God. And this is in the Zohar. The Zohar says, Rabbi Shimon opened the discussion saying, See now that I... Even I am he, and there is no Elohim with me. He's quoting the Bible. The Bible says, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no Elohim with me. And the rabbi said, Friends, listen to ancient words that I wish to reveal after permission from above has been granted for them to be said. He asked, Who is he who said, See now that I, even I am he? And he replied, The cause high above all causes. The one that is called the cause of causes is not high above all the supernal beings, but instead is a cause among all the rest of causes. So every single one of these causes shall not do anything unless it receives permission from the cause above it. The phrase, and there is no Elohim with me, alludes to Samael and the serpent, that is, other Elohim, then it would be known that Samael and the serpent never came between the Holy One, blessed be he, and his Shekinah. I kill and I make alive means that it shall be known that I kill with my Shekinah whomever is guilty, and I make alive with her whoever is innocent. This is the power of Samael, and that power acts in accordance with the Most High. Those causes which exist above Geberah. Geberah is that sphere of Mars, of severity, from which that angel Samael departs in order to punish those who deserve it and to reward those who deserve it. This is simple cause and effect. This is in the root of Judaism and Christianity, but everyone ignores it. In other words, when Samael rode into the Garden of Eden on the back of the serpent, he was doing the will of God. We like to blame the serpent like the serpent was doing something bad. But the serpent was not. The serpent is the Divine Mother. It is her essence. And guiding that force, riding on its back, is the angel Samael, who's there to tempt the woman for her own good. You see, the soul only grows when it conquers temptation. And the soul degenerates when it falls to temptation. This is simple cause and effect. It's simple energy. So Samael, doing his duty appeared in the garden to tempt the woman so that she would have the opportunity to learn from that tree of knowledge and to grow, to advance. But she did not. She gave in to her desire and failed. Now, everyone blames Samael. Everyone blames the serpent. If you look into the Zohar and you look into the Jewish, the Jewish tradition, you find that Samael is blamed for everything. At the same time, they say he's an angel, so it's a little bit hard to follow their logic. Nonetheless, the woman succumbed to temptation and had to bear the consequences. The first consequence was that the man and woman were cast out of Eden. Thus we are in our current state. As a foundational aspect, we have no idea what Eden even is. And most of us don't even believe in it. But the other consequences also came. The first one <clears throat> is that Adam and Eve conceived a child. In the Bible it states that and Adam knew his wife and Eve begat Cain. But in the Kabbalah the story goes deeper. 
it states that when the serpent tempted Eve, it injected its filth into her. And this is a very Kabbalistic statement, which cannot be read at face value. It has to be comprehended in a very deep way. That serpent is the Divine Mother. But as we've studied, the serpent is dual. Samech is dual. Light and dark. And this is why the tree of knowledge is the tree of knowledge of good and the tree of knowledge of evil. And this is why the serpent is upon it. Because from that force can come purity or impurity. Light or dark. Tob, goodness in Hebrew, or Ra, the impure spirit in Hebrew. Of course, when Eve succumbed to temptation, she manifested that force of Ra. She's the one who brought evil. Death. Because when she took that temptation from Samael and the serpent, she polarized that energy to become negative. It was through the action of the woman. That woman is not outside of us. That woman is in us. We need to look at our day-to-day -day relationship with these stories, not the ancient past. Ancient past is done. We need to know how to change it. And we fail in this way every day. Because that woman, Eve, Isha, is our own sexual organs. The serpent is the power of creativity through sex that tempts us to use that sexual power. And when we have desire, we want to use that power to feed desire, to sustain our desires, instead of doing the will of God. Instead of conquering our temptations and conquering our desires, we fall to our own desires. You see, this is that dual nature which manifests in us psychologically, energetically. In this way, we can understand that when we fall to temptation and we take that fruit to eat of it, that power, the creative power in us, the divine power that we inherit, that we receive from God to be able to create, we polarize it negatively, and that energy becomes destructive. And that is how the serpent injects its filth. That energy inverts and creates the klipot, hell. That serpent becomes the tail of Satan, which we have. That's the tail that represents our ego, desire. This failure is because we become hypnotized by desire. And desire works through the senses, through our physical senses. It tempts us with sensations that we want to experience and sustain. And sensations are an illusion this is why the Divine Mother can be called Maya, which can be translated as illusion. And the serpent utilizes that illusion in order to tempt us. Unfortunately, we don't see through the illusion. We love materialistic sensation, and we've become addicted to it. The result is the birth of Cain. It says in the Zohar that after the fall, the, the man and woman gave birth to the first son. He was the son of the serpent's defilement because two, two had intercourse with Hava, both Adam and the serpent. And she conceived from both and gave birth to two children, Cain and Abel. Cain and Hevel. 
Each resembled his own father, and their spirits were separated, one to the side of impurity and one to the side of holiness or purity. Each was in the appearance of his own aspect, the aspect from which he had come. This is why the man and woman, Adam and Eve, had two children. They reflect the two sides of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, or the pure spirit and the impure spirit. And these two children reflect their source. Abel is the pure one who's depicted as a shepherd and who God prefers his sacrifices. And Cain is depicted as a, as a gatherer of fruits from the earth. But God does not prefer his sacrifice. So Cain becomes angry and jealous. These two represent the two outcomes of that tree. Or in other words, the two outcomes of how we use our own energies. The power, the energy that arrives to us from the angel Samael and through the serpent, the Divine Mother, can be used for purity or impurity. This has to be explicitly understood for us to comprehend this science. There are many who enter into the mysteries and who think just because they know the knowledge that they're immediately on the path of goodness. But this is a lie. It's immediately depicted in the very first story of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve knew the mysteries, but they succumbed to temptation and created Cain. This is true and possibly true for any one of us if we take these mysteries and use them ignorantly, which is very common. Historically, when we look at Cain and Abel, it's from these two that humanity emerged. It says in the Zohar that from the side of Cain came all the evil species, spirits, demons, sorcerers, and all the evildoers, the ignorant ones. From the side of Abel came something more merciful, but still not perfect. It's like good wine mixed with bad. So the world was not fully established by Abel. This doesn't happen until Seth, which is the third son. But from Cain... From Cain came all the ruthless people, all the sinners, and the wicked people of the world. When we really understand the religion that we follow, when we truly understand it, we know that we are the sinners. Many people foolishly believe that once they believe in a religion, they become clean and pure, and they're no longer sinners. But those of us who are sincere and objective know better because we see what's in our own mind. And we know that in our mind are all the idolaters, adulterers, murderers, and thieves that all the scriptures condemn and state explicitly cannot enter Eden or heaven. We have all of that. All of us are fornicators and adulterers, murderers and thieves. Even if we don't do it physically, we do it in our mind. We use our imagination to commit crime. We fantasize about doing things that we know we should not do. We indulge in thoughts and feelings that break every commandment and break every vow. And we continue to do it thinking nobody notices. And we forget that God is inside of us and sees everything. None of us are innocent. Thus, every one of us is a child of Cain. We all have our own Cain. It is our mind. Our own mind is Cain. 
And we are a child of that. Jesus says in the Gospels that Satan is a liar. And liars are his children. We are children of our father, who is Cain, the liar. Unfortunately, most of us, most people, refuse to accept this. And want to believe that they are children of Abel. They are pure. Nonetheless, what we learn is that when the serpent came upon Eve and she gave birth to Cain, in turn, that child, Cain, is a child of the serpent and Samael. So when we talk about the son of Samael, the first one we need to talk about is Cain. Because Cain is the outcome of that temptation. This is why the Zohar blames Samael for everything. This is why Cain is said to have a split nature. Half human, half angel. And this is the really interesting thing. From Cain came all the impurities, all the evildoers, but by parentage, he is half angel. And it states in the Zohar that he was different from other people. He was different from the rest of humanity. He stood out because he had half divine heritage. In a Middle Eastern language, we call this a Hanas Mus. Somebody that has a split center of gravity, a double polarity in their consciousness, half angel, half demon. This is Cain. And all of us have this as our psyche. Because all of us have a little bit of purity and a lot of impurity. And the impurity is winning. It'd be nice to think that the purity is winning, but when we look objectively at humanity and our situation, we can see that really we are just gradually going down. But the rate is increasing. It's scary, but it's true. So in other words, humanity exists because of Samael. This entire humanity. This entire humanity is a result of what happened in that ancient event. And this entire humanity is a result of what's happening in this exact moment as we, in our own mind, struggle with temptation. Not only sexual temptations, but the temptations of pride and jealousy that Cain suffers from. You see, Cain is angry, proud, and jealous of Abel. We have Abel within us, too. Abel represents the animal soul who's not fully developed. We have that. But you see, Cain was born first. Cain is stronger. Cain is bigger. And he looks divine. And so we all think that Cain must be the rightful inheritor of the divine inheritance from God. He's the firstborn child. So we all love Cain. Everyone follows Cain and worships Cain. Cain looks stronger looks smarter. But unfortunately, Cain is angry and proud and jealous. And he kills his brother. And this happens in us every time we fall into temptation. After this event in our historical past, Humanity entered into a long decline, culminating in the moments that we're now living. The degeneration that we see on this planet is the greatest that has ever been on this planet. It's the greatest degree of perversity yet known. And unfortunately, this means that God 
must send his angel in order to begin the cleansing of this planet. And of course, that angel is Samael. And this is all in the book of Revelation. Samael appears there, the one who's called the word of God, the one who comes with his sword dripping with blood. You see, Samael is the angel of killing, and he is the one who comes to persecute all those who break the law. Geburah is severity, the sword of God who defends the pure, upright law. And that is Samael. This is why he says in the Zohar, my rule is over the planet Mars that indicates the spilling of blood. And this is why in Revelation, this angel emerges from God with a vesture of white, but covered and dripping with blood. That is his job and his duty. And he does it for our own good. Unfortunately, it's very painful to pass into the hands of this angel. Very painful. Nonetheless, he has the key to the abyss. If you read Revelation, you see that there is a key to unlock the klipop. Those levels of our consciousness where all of these impurities exist, this angel has the key. And thus, if we follow the doctrine of the law, the body of the law, and we learn the wisdom of Samael, we can learn how to purge ourselves. Before the great judgment, before our karma arrives mechanically, inevitably, we can take the steps to purge our own mind in advance of that and become a true son of Samael, a true child of Samael. This is different. You see, we're already children of Samael because we belong to the Aryan race. And the word Aryan comes from Aries, which is the name of Mars. This entire humanity is the Aryan race, the race of Mars, children of Samael. Yet, we do not perform the will of God. So, because of this, the angel Samael, having such a great responsibility with this humanity, because that angel has so much compassion, he began to work very hard to help us. And so he began to try to raise his primary son, his first son, from the mud of the earth. Every angel is a god. This is why we have the name Samael, which means God. But that God can send his prophet, his human soul, his earthly soul, his manifestation Buddha, right? He can send his representative to Malkut, to the world. And so the angel Samael began to do this to send his son, Samael on Vior, the Bodhisattva of Samael. Unfortunately, the human soul of Samael, the angel, had fallen, like everyone else, had resurrected his cane, and was living like any other person on the planet, a degenerate a fornicator, an adulterer, a murderer, a thief, like all of us. But the angel Samael had a great cosmic duty to fulfill, which is to fulfill the prophecies of the book of Revelation and to advance humanity in its evolution, to free humanity from its suffering. 
So the angel Samael began to push his human soul to rise up from the mud of the earth. And this entailed a long process of very painful experiences that the human soul experienced and that we know now as Samael on the Or. With the help of God, he was able to fulfill his duty and he restored himself back to his rightful place, redeemed himself of his mistakes and cleansed himself of his ego because he learned and taught the doctrine of his father, Samael, the angel of war. You see, the Bodhisattva embodied the ideal of his father. Revolution, rebellion, war against oneself, against Cain. And this is why the teaching of Samael and Vior is so potent, so direct, and does not dance around the issues. He is a warrior who presents a doctrine that is as sharp as a sword and is painful. And again, this is why many people cannot read his books and cannot accept his teaching, because they feel the beverage Samael, the angel, which wants to eliminate that ego in order to free Abel from his prison. You remember in the story of Cain and Abel, when Cain kills his brother, Abel's soul through his blood seeps into the earth. And God says, I hear your brother crying out to me from the earth. And Cain admits that he killed him. This is a symbol of how our soul becomes trapped in hell, in the pop, because of the crimes of our mind, the murder and fornication of Cain. The doctrine of Samael kills Cain in order to free Abel. But that freedom doesn't come just by Abel emerging out of the earth. That freedom comes through Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. The doctrine of Samael is the doctrine of the tree of knowledge. The angel Samael rode the serpent to tempt Eve. And so Samael and Vior, the representative of Samael, teaches the knowledge of the tree of Da'at. Gnosis, knowledge, the secret doctrine that especially relates to sex, but is directly indicating how to kill the ego, how to wage war against our own impurities. In other words, we have to kill Cain. The problem is we are Cain. Death is painful and scary when we have attachment, when we have fear. But when we know what's on the other side of death, death is no different from going to sleep. It can be pleasant. It can be beautiful. This is a matter of knowledge. Samael and Vior, when he taught his doctrine over many years, he gave a warning repeatedly throughout his books and throughout his lectures. A warning which the instructors need to repeat and need to always remember. Samael Envior stated at a great gathering of Gnostics that he was very concerned because many of the students of his teaching were going to become demons. And he named particular countries on one occasion where all these demons would come from. And he said the reason is they're only doing half the doctrine. They're practicing transmutation. They might be sacrificing, but they are not eliminating Cain. The result is Cain gets stronger. If you don't kill Cain, Cain sustains himself on the serpent, and he becomes stronger. 
he pushes Abel deeper into hell. So in other words, the doctrine of Samael can create demons or it can create angels. And this is the great controversy, the great duality of that garden, the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge. That tree can lead to the path of tub, goodness, or the path of ra, impurity, evil. Both are a result of the power of Samael. See, this angel has tremendous power in his hands. And you can see why. Gebra is right next to the top of the tree of life. But it's on the tree, the, the pillar of severity. It's great power there, but dangerous. It is the only power that can save humanity from the abyss. Humanity is already sinking. Our problems are growing worse day by day. Nature is revolting against us with diseases, with natural disasters. People are becoming more and more maddened by desire, more and more extreme in their behaviors, more and more trapped in the web of illusion, avoiding the fundamental facts of our day-to-day -day suffering. The teaching of Samael can clarify that. It is a great sword, but that sword has two edges. It can kill or it can heal. It depends upon how we use it. The greatest advice that a Gnostic instructor can give you is work on your ego every day. Transmutation is very important. And sacrifice for others is very important. But death of the ego is of the utmost importance. Because without that, Cain remains alive. And Cain is the cause of all of our problems. You see, when we look into the story, we see that Cain perceives his brother, Abel, Abel, of course, represents the soul, the one who serves God with humility. Abel is a shepherd, which is a symbol of Christ. So Abel is trying to do his part, but yet Abel is an impure soul who has not yet entered initiation. And so we have this fundamental conflict in ourselves. We have a particle of purity that we call the essence or consciousness. This is Abel. That particle remains connected with God and can receive guidance and instruction and can perform the will of God if we listen to our conscience, if we do what we know is right. Then Abel receives the gifts from God. God loves that sacrifice from Abel. When we turn our woman, Isha, into Ishe, the fire offering, and we offer that fire to God, our own inner fire, which is sexual and psychological. When we make that fire offering, God loves that and rewards Abel. But Cain becomes enraged. Cain is our mind. Our mind hates this doctrine. We might think it's interesting, but in reality, our Cain hates it and looks for the moment when he can kill Abel. So you might see students come to this doctrine who stick around for a little while, then banish. Cain won. Sad, but it happens. This conflict between Cain and Abel is happening in every person in the world. But it is very pronounced in the Gnostics. It is exacerbated. It is dramatic. Because Samael wants to kill Cain. And Samael gives his doctrine to his followers, his students, which are the Gnostics. And when Samael gives his doctrine, Cain becomes terrified because he knows the end is near. So Cain has to work very carefully to kill Abel. 
Cain does everything he can to remind everyone that he is a son of Samael. Our mind does this in us. Our mind does everything it can to preserve its integrity, its existence. Gnostic students have a great challenge to face. Very difficult. And we see this reflected throughout the groups, throughout the students, throughout the instructors and the leaders. This great struggle between Cain and Abel. We see students who envy others. Who are jealous of others. Who become angry with others. This is all Cain. We see students who are ready to kill their brothers because of jealousy. We may see, for example, a school that has a instructor who's been around for a while and who's well respected but a new student arrives who somehow has an even greater understanding of the teaching who may have visions who may have dreams or insight have experiences and everyone becomes jealous but especially the instructor who wants to be the one who's respected right there we see a mirror of Cain and Abel Really, they're brothers. The student and the instructor are brothers. But Cain, the instructor, waits for the opportunity to kill Abel through gossip, through criticism, through some event whereby they can kick the person out. These events happen over and over and over. Because people do not see their own Cain become seduced by their own cane, become angry and jealous. It says in the Zohar that when one is angry, there is a deadly poison in his rage. How interesting is that? This is interesting because, you see, Cain represents this anger against one's brother. Samael is the power of war and is related with the quality of anger when that force is inverted. So anger is a quality that becomes greatly stimulated in the Gnostics because they have that energy of Samael. And thus, anger is quick to rise, quick to blame, quick to murder. That murder may be psychological. It may be spiritual. It may not be something that you can see physically. But we murder each other in our mind. And we use the force of Samael to do it. That energy. It says further in the Zohar that whoever is angry, it is as if he is an idol worshiper since the other side burns the person, and by giving that beast to the priest, that possession separates him. Samael, a strange El, consecrated destruction, and his female is a curse that is contained in all the curses mentioned in the books. The Holy One, blessed be he, granted blessings throughout the Torah, and all the blessings are given from the right to which the priest holds on. Due to this, any consecration needs to be given to the priest who burns it in fire and destroys it from the world. The fire of the left gets calmed in the right, which is water, and then the king's wrath was pacified through it. So Samael is related with wrath, with fire, when that energy is inverted. And the way to calm it is through the hand of the priest and the power of the water. Both of these qualities are related with Samael also but the different polarities. Nonetheless, we need to be cautious. Our own able is under threat. But the threat is not from outside. It's from our own cane. 
Our own mind is the threat that wants to push us into the klipoth, into the earth. And this is true in all the levels, all the different symbols in religion. When Herod wants to kill all the children, when the Pharaoh wants to kill all the children, these are symbols of the mind wanting to kill the soul. So what we have to do is learn the doctrine of Samael, which is opposed to that Cain and wants to kill Cain. And in that way, we can enter into initiation. This is done through the cooperation of the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. Because you see, after Abel is killed in the Bible, and Cain is banished, a mark is put on Cain because Cain is still a child of Samael. That mark is a vav, the Hebrew letter, which is the sixth letter related with the arcanum of indecision, the need to choose the path again, left or right, tob or ra. Then after 130 years, Adam knew his wife again and she begat a son. And this one is called Seth. And she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord because this new son is a reincarnation of Abel. Symbolized there, those 130 years relate to the man and woman working in the holy mysteries of Da'at to raise the serpent, the Samech, up the spinal column, the tree of life, and to succeed in conquering the first initiation of major mysteries. This is the power of awakening the Kundalini in the first degree. That's equal to 100 years in esoteric terminology. The 30 years relates to the 30th vertebrae on the spine, which means that the man and woman are working in the second initiation towards completing it. This is when Sep is born. This is when Abel, the soul, reincarnates. In other words, this is the beginning of the creation of the Merkaba, the wedding garment, the solar bodies. Because after this initiation, the second, then the initiate begins to create the solar astral body, solar mental body, solar causal body. These all result because of Seth, and Seth represents that. This is also symbolized in the Zohar. It says in the Zohar, We have learned in the hidden book that as soon as the whole of man, the holy body, was firmly established above, which is composed of male and female, they were joined for a third time. Perfume emerged, that is Shep, Sep, and the worlds above and below were firmly established. Sep emerges from perfume, from above. Who's that? Samael. Remember the name Samek Mem means perfume. Samael means the perfume of God. Seth is the third son of Samael through Adam and Eve. It says further in the Zohar, we have learned that as soon as Zier Anpin, or Adam, and his female became firmly established one in the other, judgment was connected with compassion, and the female was firmly established by the male. That is Zier Anpin. Therefore, they could not ascend one without the other. This is a very revealing Kabbalistic phrase. It states that when Adam and his wife were joined,
they became firmly established one in the other. This relates to that famous biblical phrase, and they shall become one flesh. When this happens, the Zohar says, judgment was connected with compassion. Judgment is Geberah, severity, the sphere of Samael. Compassion is Hesed, mercy, the fourth Sephra. When these two unite, it's because the couple has become firmly established. In other words, when Geburah and Hesed are united, the couple has been established in the kingdom of Malkut and has successfully completed the first degree of the initiations of major mysteries. This is all hidden in the Zohar. Very beautifully hidden. And after that foundation is established and the male and female are established in that kingdom, Seth emerges from the perfume of God. That perfume is Samael. Seth is the third son of Samael, the angel, through the man and woman who work in sexual cooperation. And Seth is the beginning of the soul. When we create Seth through this knowledge that Samael provides, we are on the road back to Eden. Seth is the beginning of the return to Eden. Seth is the reincarnation of Abel, that animal soul that descended into the abyss because of being murdered by Cain. That soul returns through initiation, through the union of male-female, Adam and Eve, and through the power of Samael, this creative power of the Divine Mother that works through this angel of severity. Seth is the beginning. He's the foundation of all the righteous ones. It says in the Zohar that all of the Sadakim are children of Seth. All of the righteous ones all of the initiates, all of the prophets are the descendants of Set. And who is the ultimate incarnation of this force? Moses, in the Jewish tradition. Moses is the incarnation, the final manifestation of this energy, which is Tifereb, the human soul. very beautifully represented in these symbols and stories, if you study it seriously and without fear. So we need to learn this doctrine of Samael. We need to kill Cain. And we need the sexual cooperation in order for us to harness those forces and give birth to Seth. The birth of Seth is a great blessing from God. Remember, the woman says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Man relates to manas in Sanskrit, which is the mind. And Seth is the beginning of the process of creating bodhicitta, the wisdom mind, the awakening mind, the mind of Christ. And this is the mind of a prophet, a mind that does not reason, but a mind that is intuitive, a mind that reflects the wisdom of the divine, a mind that is empty of self-attachment. And this is a very important distinction. The mind of the prophet is not attached. The name Cain, which is our mind, Cain means to possess. The Hebrew word Cain means to possess. And that is the defining attribute of Cain. Attachment. Our mind, Cain, becomes attached to everything that it likes in terms of pleasure, respect, 
You see, Cain in the Bible wants God to recognize him first because Cain says, I'm the firstborn. I am the rightful inheritor. Cain says this. And that's why Cain kills Abel. Because Cain is attached. We all have that. Attached to sensation. Attached to our sense of self. We want to be respected. We want to be admired. We want to be followed. We want money. Fame. Recognition. Whatever it is we want. That's Cain. But Seth, the bodhicitta, the ethereal man, has no attachment, but cleaves only to God. That mind has no sense of self as separate. Seth does not suffer the heresy of separateness, of feeling itself better than anyone else or distinct from anyone else. That mind seeks only to serve. Cain wants to be served. Do you have any questions? It's a very interesting question. And I wish that I could say that there was a, a way to inspire humanity to change for the better. Unfortunately, humanity has had centuries of the prophets coming to give warnings, to give guidance, to give inspiration. And humanity has rejected them all. Now in these times we see that the law is descending with a fury upon us. Our karma is arriving. The results of all of our mistakes are beginning to bear fruit. That is why we have these terrible calamities like the tragedies of 9-11 and many other types of tragedies that are occurring all over the planet. One would hope that those events would stimulate the able in each of us to cry out from the earth to his parents, us, so that we will work to free him, to enter the path. But unfortunately, Cain's a lot louder. And so when these events happen... Cain is like Pilate in the Gospels, always washes his hands. You see, with these different events, no matter which country an event happens in, the people there blame somebody else. All the people in America blamed other people for the problems that happen here. No one accepts responsibility. No one. And the same is true in every country on the planet. Now, if this is happening in society... It's because it's happening in us individually. Our whole society is only an extension of what we are as a mind. And when we see our society refusing to accept responsibility for its mistakes and its stupidities, of which there are many, which we couldn't even name them all, too many, we do it ourselves. That's why it happens. So the hope for humanity is in the individual. It's in you. If you can do it, then there is hope for others. And if you cannot, humanity is lost. We cannot look outside for humanity to be saved. We have to look inside. To first save ourselves, 
kill Cain, our mind, our ego, our desire, that has to die. When that dies, Abel starts to reincarnate in Sep. It's a long process. It's a simple image, but it's a long process. But through that, that pure mind begins to emerge, which can answer the problems that the world has, which can solve the problems, but only through that mind. If people do not create Seth in themselves, if they do not free themselves from Cain, there is no hope for them. And that's why Samael Anvior stated repeatedly, this humanity is already lost because nobody wants to be free of Cain. People love Cain. Everybody just wants to follow a leader and let them have responsibility for them. And this is true politically and socially and spiritually. Everybody just wants to attach themselves to a person and put responsibility on that person for our welfare. So now we vote a new person into office and everybody says, he's going to save us. He's not going to save anybody. Or we find a new spiritual group or a spiritual leader and we say, he's the one. He will save us. This is a lie. The only one who can save us is inside of us. And the only way for that to happen is if Cain is dead. Our mind. No one outside can do anything. Is there another question? Okay. It's a very good question. In synthesis, the question is, how can we trust any religion or society when the ego rules and when the ego has corrupted them? The fact is that we cannot. This is partly why in ancient times the Gnostics were persecuted. Because the Gnostics know, as now and, and knew back then, that a spiritual authority in the physical world cannot save your soul. No priest, no spiritual leader, no prophet, no master can save you from yourself. Only you can do that. It doesn't matter if our government changes. We can change political systems. We can move to different countries. It won't change our fundamental situation. We can move from one spiritual group to another spiritual group. It won't change our situation. We can drop our family religion and adopt a new religion, and it still will not change our situation because Cain is still alive. Thus, we need to find out how do we kill Cain. If we can't trust religion, and we can't trust our governments, and we can't trust our spiritual groups, who can we trust? God. God is inside of you, not outside. The one that can redeem you and save you and give you the wisdom and guidance you need is inside. But first you have to listen. You have to learn how to listen to your conscience. And from that, awaken it. That conscience is able. Havel. It's that sense of knowing the difference between Cain and Abel, right and wrong. When we start to listen to that and go deeper into listening to that, that voice connects directly to the voice of God who's inside of us. And we learn that listening by quieting the mind. We call this meditation, but it's not just referring to a few minutes of the day. 
It's something that we need to be doing continually, 24 hours a day, to quiet the loud, noisy cane and to listen to the consciousness. In that way, we can understand any scripture because we can be guided by the intuitive knowledge that comes through the heart. This lecture that I've given you today, I did not know what it was until I gave the lecture. I was listening as best I could to the guidance I was getting from my own inner being and trying to listen and trying to follow the guidance that I get in my heart. This isn't God coming down out of the clouds. It's simple conscience, intuition, listening carefully inside, not going to anyone else, not getting opinions, not relying on any outside source, but inside. And in that way, we teach these lectures. And in that way, we try to emulate the example of Samael and Vior, who did the same. And that's how we receive the guidance of God and can learn what real religion means. Another question? How is Samael related to Lucifer, if they are related at all? Samael and Lucifer have a very deep relationship. In some ways, you can say that symbolically, they are the same. in the sense they are the same force. Because the name Lucifer is Latin and means the carrier of light. Lucy is light. Fair is to ferry or carry. So Lucifer, as it says in the Bible, was the greatest angel, the brightest angel. But Lucifer fell. Why? Because of pride. Cain. This happens because of the fall. It's all related with the story of Adam and Eve. Very deep. But the name of uh, the Bodhisattva Samael on Veor carries the same meaning because on Veor. Veor means and light. Or is light in Hebrew. The Ve is a Vav, which means and. On means strength. So that on the or is the light and strength of Samael. And that light and strength emerges from the perfume, the beverage of God. And that is what Lucifer uses to tempt us. So we can say psychologically that our own inner Lucifer is a reflection of Samael and relies upon and is integral with that energy, that force. Very deep. Another question? Well, it says that uh, whoever kills Cain will be avenged seven times. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, uh, the avenging of Cain is also a very deep symbol and uh, relates to the seven fundamental defects that we have. The pride, anger, lust, envy, jealousy, etc. The thing is that Cain is split. Cain is a child of Samael. And thus, in the Bible we see that Cain even repents. And so he receives some mercy from God. And in what we can see symbolized there is that there is a function, there is a, a portion of that mind that is extracted or saved when Cain is killed. Because that portion belongs to God. And so Cain receives that protection from God in honor of that. When we say kill Cain, you see, Cain and Abel, in a sense, are the same. When we say kill, kill Cain, we're saying kill the impure part, but free the pure part. And when God banishes Cain and puts protection on Cain, it's a recognition that, that purity and impurity are still connected. 
Right, good and evil. And we have that. We are that mixture. This uh, mixture of severity and mercy is Gebra and Chesed. And this is the mixture of Samael as an angel. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,